then we are going to moderate this thing. So a little bit about um, our moderator. When did I get you? He has been doing some amazing work in the community. Like he interviews powerful people like yourself. He does some just amazing work. He's always engaged the different celebrities within our community. He's there interviewing them. Anytime anybody's doing anything positive, he's right there. So, Tree, can you tell you know everybody a little bit about yourself before we jump in the panel and we're gonna learn about our panelists? Well, thanks for the introduction. Hello everybody, my name is Tree Harris. My brother and I we own a business called Message from the Youth and with that media company, like we, we highlight the positivity within our community and elsewhere, like whether it's in San Diego or outside of San Diego, and we have to bring a really positive message to the youth because we're all about uplifting, encouraging, inspiring, and motivating. Now, how are you guys doing today? Good. 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 We're happy that you're here. So I'm going to pass my mic around because he's going to talk more than I am. And if you could just say your name again and a little bit about the work that you do um, here in the community um, and even how you guys know each other because you have done some great work together as well. Shout out to all the youth that are in here. Let's give them a Woo! So in their countries, 
you pull up to the curb. You don't ask the teacher a question, a principal a question, or anything. They are the living, breathing, you just don't. And so when they come here, we have to retrain them, reteach them, but also make sure that they feel celebrated. And remember, if they have a, um, I call it a PhD, and they say, what? I don't have that. I said, sure you do. You graduated from a high school. You have a high school public diploma. That's a PhD. And that just inspires a parent to say, hey, I do have a PhD. So I'm all about uplifting each other, and accountability is just not the enemy. You can't become a lawyer. You can't 
become a judge. You can be the next city attorney. And so those are the kinds of things that remind me that we do need to create more youth justice opportunities. But it starts with remember that everything is not cookie cutter. There is not one size that fits all. And you need to make sure that you're writing the narrative individually for each person. For so many of us, it's the catalyst for social change and it's the catalyst for liberation, right? For freedom. And so, as you were talking this last letter, you reminded me of a quote that I often think back on is that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the outcomes that it gets, right? So, the injustices that we see today in our financial system and all the inequities in terms of education and career outcomes, the systems were perfectly designed to receive the outcomes that they're getting, right? And so when we think about the, the education to uh, prison pipe, pipeline, perfectly designed to, to receive the, the results that it's getting, perfectly designed to see the people that we see in prison right now in those prisons. And so when I think about my role in education, it's always been about disrupting those designs and building up a new system where we can receive true justice, right, and see equitable outcomes, especially for our black and brown children. In terms of education spaces and K-12 spaces, I think about you know some of my own experiences navigating uh, education in K-12 and higher education, both as a student but also as a parent advocate. Right? Um, it took you know years of education and having to have all these credentials to to receive some type of respect uh, from from respect from teachers and principals at my own kids' school. I mean, recently had an experience uh, where my son at the pandemic, we, we ended the pandemic, he was going into the second grade and he was struggling with reading. And it was it was really, uh, it was a big deal for us, right? Because here I am as an educator, all these years of experience and education and my son can read. And we were in a public high school, a public elementary school, and the teacher just kept saying, he's gonna be fine, he's gonna be fine. Cut to halfway through the pandemic, we had to actually transition him into a private school. And through that private education, he was he became a top reader in his class and is now um, is at the top of his class. Which is great. I'm here he's smiling here. But the point is, right, that's not justice. Because there's so many other parents whose kids were in that same class who were reading at lower levels will not have an opportunity, do not have the means or the resources to be able to move their kid into another school, right? To be able to receive that same level of equity and access and outcomes for their student. And it, it pained my heart because I know what it means for a black boy to not be able to read in this society, right? We all know what that means and what type of outcomes it looks like. So when I think about educational justice, it's about bringing those same resources that that private school has into a public school that you don't have to move your kid into a private school in order for them to know how to read. And that's what educational justice is for me. You, you really just struck a, a nerve, right? So today is the anniversary of me losing my mom. And I've only told this story probably one at a time, but I did not learn to read until I was about 11. And um, it's something that no one ever believes because I've gone on to run for office multiple times. I ran multiple organizations, do great things, work, you know, president, I still say President Maxwell. <laughs> But working with the NAACP, they have so many different things. So when I tell people that I couldn't read until I was 12, um, and I talk to kids, they like, oh, you know. Um, but I had a mom that advocated for me. And she, she, I went to predominantly, uh, we're going to talk about race a lot, you know. I, we're going to have some uncomfortable conversations. But I uh, went to predominantly white schools. And it wasn't just white schools that fell me. I went to a private black school. And sometimes uh, even us people of color ask for things that we don't have the capacity to be able to manage. And 
so I went to a school that did not know how to manage my needs, right? And so I went to a public school, um, and they did not know because from their perspective, she's so intelligent. But I wasn't interested. That's not how I learned, right? I learned very differently, so I could not read. And my mom would go to, that's how I learned about what the school board was. I learned at 11 years old what the school board was because my mom was going up there to say, these teachers are failing my daughter. And she might be intelligent or all these great things, but the way in which she learns looks a lot different. And so that's why I thought this, this panel was so important to have a panel on policy, politics, and parent engagement because every day I get parents ask, how do I advocate for my child and how do I get that change? And what you did, if we have to move them to a different school. So my next question for you all is, what does it look like to walk a parent through parent engagement and advocacy? How, what are the tools, what are the things that you teach parents um, to make that change? In a situation like myself, or where a child has an IEP, or um, they're dealing with racial issues, they're dealing with bullying. How do you walk a parent through that, and what would you say to a parent? Well, first of all, I would say thank you for coming and um, presenting you, your family, and your issue to me, because that takes a lot of courage. A lot of people are suffering in silence. And we want to remember that you don't have to suffer in silence. There's always somebody ready to help you when you're ready to get that help. So you are showing your family how powerful you are when you do ask someone for assistance. So I'm just gonna use my son who um, graduated from an HBCU, but when he was in um, elementary school, they said that he couldn't read. I said, are you sure? Because see, at our house, every Sunday after church, we go to Malcolm X Library, one of the few libraries that are named after one of us. So we wanna make sure that every black child in this region has a library card. And if you can, stop by and help Malcolm X Library so we can keep getting new books. But I digress. See, it's very important to start a ritual with your family. So our family happened to do Malcolm X every Sunday. So my son was reading, but not at grade level. And so I said, okay, well, how did you, how did you come to that? And you decided that because he sat at a table with other black boys that weren't reading at grade level. So you just did a broad brush. And that's what we find in this racist society, that people want to do a broad brush. And so my son, Eugene, happened to be reading three grade levels above, but you never called on him. My son doesn't like to raise his hand, so he never raised his hand, but he had the answer to the question. But if the TA would go over to the table, he would give the TA the question, but he would not raise his hand when the teacher would ask. So uh, not allowing your students, your children, your grandchildren, guardians, to be labeled with a broad brush, making sure that they're individually identified, and then saying, okay, those are my shortcomings. Then look at the school's resources, the Title I money, the SSC, School Site Council, get involved with the PTA, the school governance team, you're sitting there with the policy decision makers of your campus, and you can assist in changing the culture. Every school, every system needs a culture shift. You have to be a part of the change that you want to see. And if you think that only one voice speaking for two minutes at a meeting cannot change a policy, oh, au contraire, au contraire. We have people in our city that have been advocating for education over 30 years. I've never been a paid consultant for anybody. I've never sat on anyone's payroll. We have changed policies and procedures for the second largest school district because we're intentional. We show up, and sometimes we show out. <laughs> and it's intentional, and it's intentional. So you put a list together, I want my son or daughter to read two or three grade levels above. My daughter also graduated college from Greensboro, North Carolina from Bennett, and she reminds me often, you didn't let me skip grades when they asked you, and I didn't. I let my daughter be the top of her class at the age appropriate so that she can develop the way that she needed to. I think that if you decide as a family, you want your child to skip a grade, then you need to make sure that you're asking the intentional questions of things that they won't be able to do. 
because one of her best friends, their parent allowed her to skip. And she didn't get to participate in a whole bunch because of the age difference. It was wonderful for you to be able to brag that your, your daughter skipped some grades, but it also hurt her in the long run because she couldn't keep up and she couldn't do some things with her peers. So it's a decision that you have to make. But don't let anybody say that just because you're not reading at third grade level that the prison is building a bed. Not at all. That's the narrative that they wrote. That's the narrative that we disturb. We have reading programs in the community, in our churches, in our Lions Club. We can change the narrative of any family. You just need to speak up. Did you read the U.S. Code of Federal Regulation? Did you did you know that you're having your child from K to 12? Did you know that? And see, that's what shocks parents. Like they suddenly have to become lawyers, legal experts, just to get something for their child. And whether it's an IEP, a 504, and then all of a sudden you need to recognize what that board policy says, right? What does idea of faith mean? How can I get my child tested to be able to be literate? And nobody told you when you was in the hospital, here's a handbook, you need to know all these yeah. laws and codes and, and how to be a, a politician just to get your child in school. That's a reality. And so my thing is first, when I, when I talk to parents, I want to know how well they understand the governance structure that rules them and their child's education. What is it that you really know about? Right? Because it's hard to say you're violating my rights if you don't know what your rights are. It's hard to um, have a board hear you when you don't really understand your policies. Right? Um, and, it, and, and, and then it, it really becomes challenging to escalate a matter outside of a, a school principal or school board if you don't understand the flow chart and the governance structure. So my question always is power, right? This is about power. Allocation of resources, which is an economic thing, is always attached to power and authority, okay? Power, who has it? At whose benefit is it held? And at whose expense? And if my children are expendable, we need to shift the power, okay? And so, if we look at a community and the children are consistently generationally expendable, there's a power exchange that needs to take place, a disruption in that governance structure um, and who is going to be accountable, right? We the people vote. We the people do have power. But do you know it? And do you know what you need to know when you enter your child into a publicly funded Taxpayer paid. So education's not free. Yeah. We pay for that. Okay? School. Right? And so, as um, Tariq will tell you, I took them straight from that situation straight to Congress. Let's go. <laughs> okay? We're not going to talk to people that don't want to listen that have perpetually failed you. I'm not gonna go to my oppressor and say, let me free. We're going to escalate this matter all the way to the White House, and that's what we did, okay? And so that is what I call advocacy. That is what I call we the people, and that is what I call looking at the moral compass. Where is your value for our children? And we're not gonna let you rest until you understand that you serve us in this power structure, okay? And if you don't want to serve, then we will replace you. And I educate parents every day, because I'm also a school board trustee, on what that looks like, right? What does it look like for you to be sitting in that seat? What does it look like for you to be saying, here is my neighbor and I need to help my neighbor, right? Leaving none of each other behind. And so that's how you build power, 
maintain power and have equitable allocation of resources because the persons that are gonna be affected are sitting in the decision-making seats. One person at a time, one family at a time, one community at a time. And that's how I teach parent engagement. One other thing I need to mention. Every single one of us have mentioned uh, or discussed um, some type of advocacy that we've done or that our parents have done. And so I debunk the narrative that black parents don't care about the children's education. <laughs> not only have we fought for our children's education, but we fought for the entire school yep. education. And when people say, well, black parents aren't engaged, well, what does your involvement look like? Because those are the parents that I've seen in my whole life fighting for what's right when it comes to education. And out of all the battles that we could have fought straight out of into freedom, we fought for quality schools, resources to educate, and the ability to be able to read and write. We could have did a whole bunch of other stuff and started a whole bunch of other wars. And so I'm reminded about the facts and the lives that fought before us in, in, in the shoulders that we stand on and the backs that were broken, all because of education. And so I take it very serious, all the way from early childhood till we graduate, because if the government is going to compel you, parents, through compulsory attendance laws, to have your child in a specific program, you better understand who's government. Yeah. and what they said. And so, uh, you know, really that's a start. Just understanding that governance structure, understanding that escalation process, not leaving it in the hands of local people, but taking it all the way to the U.S. Department of, of Education if you have to, that oversees civil rights, inequities, inequities, and everywhere else that you have to, and being that squeaky will until the children receive the justice they deserve.
was bringing the heat when I asked each of you to come, but y'all are really bringing it. Are you guys having a good time? Are you getting some good information, some education, um, putting some fire under all of us? I'm gonna see all of y'all on Tuesday. Um, I'm gonna need this for my <laughs> But I'm gonna pass it back to um, Tyreek, but I just wanted to check in with you all. We're going to do a power round. We want to make this um, as engaging as possible. We want to make sure that this is interactive and you all get what you need from us um, and our great panelists. So he's going to open it up for us. Okay, so I just want to give you guys like a little background about my brother and I, our situation. So we went to Lincoln High School and in the midst of that, it's been a nightmare because at this school, we realized how unjust the education system is, how schools have failed us, how it's just a system that, that perpetuates violence and allows students to be in control instead of teachers. And when students are in control, all chaos is there, you know? And even when the teachers, principals, foster this environment of hostility and violence and they don't do anything about it to change the circumstances, their bosses don't do anything. No matter how many parents come forth, no matter how many students come forth, no matter how many times the protests are come against them and, and have peaceful demonstrations, they always lead us to a brute force. So if you Google search Harris versus Unified, you will see that my family has been the most retaliated family ever. My father's been arrested just for speaking out against what's going on in the school, not just in our situation, but other children. A kid got stabbed in his neck, stuff like that. that that's just regular at Lincoln High School, but they covered that up. They cover it up from the news and they even tell us like we can't we can't speak on this situation, we can't speak on that. That's what they used to tell us, that's what the teachers used to tell us, that's what the principals used to tell us. So we my, my mother and father, they're activists, they're youth activists, they speak up for youth all around the world, especially right here in San Diego, because this is called the Mississippi of the West. So I would like to also speak about people like City Martin that are in control of the education system. Kevin Bible. And if you look at all of these people, the first thing you see is all the lawsuits that's against them. <laughs> For example, Kevin Bible, he's been accused of raping, raping other men. These are people that's in the school board, the school board presidents. These are the people that are in charge of the principals and our teachers. So that speaks for itself. So my question to you is, I want you to identify the school to prison pipeline system and talk about ways we can change it. So I, I want to be very clear that there is um, a targeted practice that takes place, and black boys are heard at the top of that, okay? So if we look at um, excessive, exclusionary, harsh punishment, some people call it zero tolerance practices, you will see um, if you were to chart it, black boys at the top, black girls right underneath that, and all other demographics of boys are in black girls, okay? And, and, and really, um, if you're, by the time you're in fifth grade, and you're ex continuously punished and targeted, so, in comparison to your counterparts, what options do you really have, okay? If you're expelled, what, what options for a school do you really have? Expulsions, right? And, and, and lately I've been noticing a lot of our, our girls are being expelled at phenomenal rates. And what happens is in, in, a, in a diversity, equity, and inclusion checkbox meeting that, where people meet to meet again, they say, we're not suspending the black boys, but you're expelling the black girls. And that goes undetected, okay? And so we have to be very um, aware of the punishment practices at any school, okay? What is their accountability and check mechanism? I wanna know who you asked to before you even suspended and signed a suspension. I want to know how many people were at that table to help the principal make that decision because if you have a history and a pattern of targeting a specific persons, you shouldn't be making those decisions on your own, okay? 
And so parents need to be saying, we want a check and accountability system. The principal at this school can't um, do any um, type of expulsions or suspensions unless they have three other people they check in with. You can do that. I've seen it then, and I've advocated for it in other places. Okay, start there. Next uh, step is look at the um, punishment practices that exclude a child from their education, that actually physically remove them from the environment of learning where they don't have access to their education. And look at the time frames. I just, you know, was helping a parent last week and their daughter was suspended for 10 days. What did she learn for 10 days? You got funded to teach this child for 10 days, and I want to know what those instructional minutes look like, okay? So that's one thing that needs to be challenged. If my child received funding to get instructional minutes, and this is the amount of instructional minutes they were supposed to receive, who's going to make up the deficit for the time that was lost that you excluded her from her education? That would be a question to ask, right? Where are those instructional minutes at? Who's making it up, okay? Don't wait six months later and find out like that 10 days impacted your child and, and ask, ask while it's taking place. And then if you believe that your child has just been excessively targeted year after year because of what, what has happened, this thing is so this thing is so multi-layered and complex. I can talk about this for hours, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna give some tips, okay? Um, if you believe that your child was targeted in kindergarten, um, I've even seen it in, in SST meetings, um, 504 meetings, where certain wording was used um, to, uh, to illustrate or narrate um, the child as a problem or a threat, right? That follows them and it just builds every year, and that's what people call a padded file. You believe that has happened under your FERPA rights, okay? You have the uh, ability to um, see all of the school records, including behavior records, including pictures, including any kind of um, video tapes, audio, whatever that may be, you need to start there. Don't don't let your FERP rights get violated. You have the ability. F E R P A. Okay. Now, after that, if you review those things, because you might be realizing as I'm talking, wow, this happened to my kid and they're in fourth grade, what do I do? Once you review those things, then if there's anything that is um, not accurate, I, you need to um, file a formal complaint and start a formal complaint process about your child's records. Because I'm going to tell you what, I took my two children out of school. My son was targeted by third grade, where the teacher had him sit facing the wall and the rest of the kids was watching the Charlie Brown movie in first grade. Okay, the three strikes you're out program, what she said he was on. Okay, what is this? Is this a school or a prison? Explain yourself, okay? Uh, and by second grade, they had him on what I call a, a mini Caltrans program. Why is my son walking around the outer parts of the cafeteria and the playground picking up trash while all the other kids are playing. Is this Caltrans or is he getting an education? Somebody explain yourself. And so with that being said, of course I would not, I did not leave my uh, child in that environment and, and now he is doing wonderfully, but I also sued because I'm not playing. There's an escalation process and you need to have your documentation. And so if you believe that these things are happening, don't leave it on a, I called and they told me this. File those formal complaints and use those formal processes. I'm gonna let this conversation just cut past by me now because I'll be getting triggered. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot, it's a lot. And, 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 I, and these are the things that I help parents with every day. So definitely you can reach out to myself or my organization um, with that paperwork side or that legal complaint side because we do help with um, escalating legal actions that are warranted. So I'm going ahead and let this mic pass by me right now. No, that's good information. And if anybody wants to get a hold of any of our panelists, you can email the Youth Justice Summit and we will get out their information. And they are so, I call them all the time every day. Um, 
uh, Dr. Francine and <laughs> Dr. Carter, um, if you guys can give a quick answer to, to the question, and then we want to open it up for just a few minutes. Like I said, we're going to do a power round of questions, and they're going to answer pretty fast. Okay. So for me, to end the school to prison pipeline, it was to make sure that parents understand you keep a cumulative file at home. So when you're in Head Start and you get that Johnny did good today, and they show you when you go to pick up Johnny, make a copy of it, and there starts your cumulative file. My children's file never had a piece of paper that was not at our home. So no one can ever do paper to paper with me because my file matched your file. And sometimes my file trumped their file because you lied. So it's always making sure that you have everything that your child does when anybody says, my children were groomed from little on because of who their mother was. If somebody says something to you, make sure that you tell me before they tell me. So I need yours. I always make friends with the custodial staff. They are my favorite staff on every campus, okay? Don't let a title fool you. Somebody might have an MBA behind their name, a PhD, it don't matter. It doesn't matter. That just meant that they wanted to stay in class longer while you were living life. Okay? So those initials are wonderful for others, but please don't let them intimidate you. We can beat this thing together, and it's just we have to be intentional and unapologetic. I just have one quick thing to add. I just want for parents to really understand this concept of the school to prison pipeline is informed by a body of research that has proven that a, a student's reading level by, I think it's kindergarten, third grade, you can predict their outcomes in terms of career and whether they will end up in prison or not, right? So this is a real thing, this is a deep thing, this is why the parent engagement piece is important, right, for you to understand that you can even predict by the third grade. So what I said earlier, every system is perfectly designed to receive the outcomes that it gets. It's by design, not by accident, that we see the demographics that we currently see in our prison systems, right? And so we need to be vigilant, hyper vigilant, yeah. for checking these things in our educational systems. And you can see them by the things that our panelists already mentioned, right? You can see them by looking at the grading levels. You can see them by looking at the discipline practices. We have a report done by two researchers from San Diego State University on San Diego city schools about the suspension rates of black students, particularly black male students, being higher than any other uh, rate in, the, in our county, but also in the state, right? So these are all things that points towards we are part of this, these systems that are producing these negative outcomes for students. And I think my panelists did a great job of, of highlighting ways that you can get involved to disrupt the system. Okay, we're gonna do a speed round. I, I mean this, you guys. So, anybody have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna go fast. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm Christina's daughter, and I <laughs> and I, I have to. Um, I want to know because I'm not a parent, but I want to know for other parents. If they were to go to any one of you activists and ask for help, how would they need to uh, organize their complaints to get, help you be able to help them? That's a good question. Give it up for her. So when a parent has an issue, the first thing they need to do is write their issue down. The passion, the anger, it will lose you two minutes later. So as soon as your child comes home and they say, Mom, she disrespected me in class, then you and the child need to sit and put pen to paper. And then the investigation starts. When somebody, I'm going to use the second largest school district in California, when a parent has an issue, they try to stay on campus with it for as long as they can. Then when they don't, they're kicked off to the Quality Assurance. Quality Assurance Office is allegedly independent and is supposed to investigate your issue. But everybody, for the last three years, and Quality Assurance gets the same answer. The principal was right. So we don't stop there. Every, we have to check the box with their system to disrupt their system. So you don't want to miss a step. So you start the investigation from your end with your pen to paper, then we move to quality assurance, we move to CDR, we move and we keep it moving. And we're moving, okay. Everybody can't answer the question, okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, 
Um, so I may not be a person of color myself, but I do, and I am very familiar with discrimination within the school system because I am a transgender person. And I'm very familiar with the, I think it's the Mesa Spring Valley School District, and I went to a private school disguising itself as a public school throughout elementary and middle school. And that school used to be known as Lopresta, but it is now known as Steve Academy. And within my time and years at that school, I've noticed over the duration of time that there's been an extensive history of discrimination against people of color and trans people and the system which I have been, you know, I have talked to the counselor and she has referred to the system as very, and I quote Republican, has gone out of its way to discriminate against these marginalized groups of people. And I was wondering if I, I have been the only person to speak up about this school in particular or if it has been other people. And that was my question. Great question. Give it up. district 
San Diego Unified, second largest school district, saying is, if I give you 30 days, you will go away. They have operated that way for decades, and that's why the second largest school district gets to sweep everything up under the carpet. It's time to pull that carpet and ride that carpet, people. about the employee. I don't know if they contacted the Fair Employment Housing Association about that. Um, they have that option to escalate the matter. Also, just know that you can, on the online portal for the United States Department of Justice, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, and the United States Department of um, Education, okay? If there are civil rights violations, you can report them, but it doesn't have to be necessarily regarding yourself. You can say who you're reporting it about. So say, for instance, somebody has an NDA, but the neighbor cared about what happened to the kid, right? Because it impacted their child that's in the ed educational environment as well. You can say, here is a civil, major civil rights violation. Here's the evidence that I have. Um, this is how it impacted my child, who was a student with um, the child that was harmed. Okay, and, and sometimes that needs to happen. Um, my son's co-students, their parents were calling me, we're concerned about what our children are telling us that's happening to your son. Okay, let's all go, right? Because it's not just about what happened to him, it's about them being denied um, access to a proper um, education as well. And that's one thing we, and I'm not gonna give my big civil rights speech, but I'll call down, I'll play. But, um, that's one thing we do have to realize. When children are being discriminated against and targeted, there's an American um, Academy of Pediatrics document that's called The Impact of Racism on Child and Adolescent Health. We need to be aware of the impact that it's have, having on the children that are looking on. They, too, will experience acute health symptoms, mental health issues, right? Because of their inability to be able to defend their friend, okay? Um, or just because they know it's wrong and they hold that in and hold that in. So when my dear sister right here said, pay attention to certain things, I want you guys, if your parents or grandparents, pay attention to a child that is complaining about a stomach ache every day. There's something wrong with that. Pay attention to that child that may be pulling their hair out, biting their nails all the way down to the nuts. There is some, nobody should go in to get an education and have to bite their nails all the way off. Right. Their stomach shouldn't be hurt. Okay. What kind of education is that? So pay attention because those are signs of harm. Those are signs that that child is in a toxic environment. Okay? Um, and so never leave your child in school. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Really quick before the DJ plays this out, I want to say, did y'all enjoy that? Yes. Okay, okay, give it up for them.